This is Michael Ostrelink, and I'm speaking with Carrie Severino. She's Chief Counsel and Policy Director for the Judicial Crisis Network. Hi, Carrie. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, you have an interesting project on um, Mrs. Kagan. Can you speak to that and the upcoming Supreme Court case on Obamacare? Exactly. We just released a white paper, Justice Kagan, the justice who knew too much, uh, making the argument that Justice Kagan, during her time as Solicitor General, uh, was so involved with the defense of the Obamacare law, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, that she must recuse herself now from the cases challenging its constitutionality. And uh, right after the, the paper came out, it, this became an even more uh, focused issue because the Supreme Court has now accepted cert, not on one but or two, but on three different uh, cases all, that were all part of the Eleventh Circuit argument, and they've even granted up to five and a half hours to argue these cases. That is extraordinary. Normally, normally you get sixty minutes of argument. So this is a um, this is going to be a historic case. We've been saying that all along. It's going to be the case of the century, and now the Supreme Court has really underlined the importance. What we're concerned about is that one of the justices on the case. Uh, is essentially tainted by her previous involvement in this issue. So we want to make sure that the decision that is going to be so important to our the, the, whether our um, limited government really continues that is decided by by justices who are appropriately sitting on the case. What kind of role did Ms. Kagan play in Obamacare? Well, the Solicitor General normally addresses cases that have come up through the appeals process. They have to okay an appeal for any government cases, and then they take care of them at the Supreme Court level, they do all the arguments. But in this case, there was strategy meetings going on with the White House, with DOJ officials, starting as early as, as January 2010. This is months before the bill was even passed, uh, because they already knew people were talking about the constitutional concerns with, uh, with Obamacare. So they started having these strategy meetings, and they said, should we get the Solicitor General's office involved? So Justice Kagan, the first thing she did, and then Solicitor General Kagan, was said, yes, I definitely want my office involved. This is taking it out of the normal course and reaching down and saying, let's, let's get involved at, a, at an early level. She then, the second major way she was involved is she it determined the staffing on that. So this isn't, this isn't just, you know, this automatically falls into the system and she had nothing to do with it. She said, I want to have my, my political deputy involved. There's only two political appointees in the Solicitor General's office. Solicitor General Kagan and then Neil Cattell, her chief political deputy. Everyone else is, an, is just a, a, a career attorney. So she wanted someone else who was appointed by the Obama administration dealing with the defense of this law. And then throughout the process, there were emails. We, we know this through FOIA requests that have, have produced a number of email documents. We can see that there's emails where stuff is redacted, uh, material that was either subject to attorney-client privilege or deliberative process privilege, but internal uh, privileged material that we can't even see because it's redacted. Now, if Elena Kagan was able to see these emails, if she's all of them that I'm talking about are ones where she's copied on them or things like that, she's receiving privileged information. That means that's information she can't even share with her own fellow justices on the Supreme Court. This is, puts her in a position of being very central to this type of strategy. She said on, on the record that she said, oh, I haven't offered my opinion on this law, and no one's asking my opinion, but it doesn't matter if you've, if you've offered your own opinion, if you've been there in the room when other people have been talking about the strategy. She knows inside things about, about these issues that it's, it's not appropriate now for her to go back and sit on this case as a judge. Now, what would be necessary her to recuse herself? Does she just have to say, "I recuse myself," or is there a process that other people can put pressure on the on the Supreme Court to encourage her to recuse herself? Mm -hmm. What's happening along those lines? Many times now, the justices will recuse themselves just by themselves, as a matter of course, because if they own stock in a company and they're one of the parties, or if one of their if their spouse or a family member is is, is employed by a company or filed something in the case, they'll, they'll automatically recuse themselves. And it just comes out in the orders, it's noted at the bottom, Justice so-and-so took no part in the consideration of this case. So all she has to do is is you know tell the clerk of court I'm going to recuse myself in this case. They don't even normally explain the reasons. People then have to kind of guess, and many times they can piece together what the reason was, but they don't even have to explain the reasons. However, the, it is possible to make a motion for recusal. That's happened on, on several occasions, and so it remains to be seen whether uh, one of the parties or whether another um, organization might move that she recuse herself. Uh, the parties have a have a tough strategy point to to decide there because. You don't want to shoot the king unless you know you're going to hit. And if they 
write a, an article saying, Justice Kagan, you are going to be partial in this case. We don't trust your vote. And then she decides to sit in the case. You've kind of lost one vote. So I think that, that I'm not sure I'm gonna, we're going to see any parties um, moving for her recusal. But she ultimately, the, the duty falls on her to decide, de determine that, yes, this, this federal statute, because it's by, it's by statute. It's 28 U.S.C. 455 outlines when you need to recuse yourself. Um, and both because she's participated as counsel in the case and because I think a, a reasonable person would question her impartiality in this case, uh, two different provisions of the statute, I think she should come to the conclusion that she needs to recuse. I've been talking to Carrie Severino. She's Chief Counsel and Policy Director for the Judicial Crisis Network. Uh, Carrie, how can people learn more both about the Judicial Crisis Network and the white paper you mentioned? Our white paper is available on our website. It's at judicialnetwork.com. I also blog about the issue at National Review Online and their Bench Memos blog, and then we, we have those posted on our website as well. You can also join our Facebook uh, page, and that, that, that keeps you up to date with some of the things that I've been writing on this, and then as well as it, when other news comes up, we try to post that so people can see how this issue is progressing. It's really starting to heat up. We're seeing members of Congress now um, who are who are making statements. Senator Sessions, Senator Lee have, have said things, Representative Fleming. So um, I think we're, there's a lot of interest in, in the, this case. Great. Thank you. Thanks.